If you are, find yourself in the back and you want to move forward and bring your state forward, please do. You're sitting by states and we're expecting, uh, you know, I think many of you have left and so there's some room left open. So if you feel like moving forward, be comfortable to do that. Are you, you hear me? This is going to be a fun session. You ready? Yeah. All right. We have an amazing panel of exciting women who are going to be interacting with you this morning. <clears throat> so again, if you feel like moving forward, please feel do. I want to thank you for being here with us this morning. Give yourself a hand. You got up after Bourbon Street. <laughs> Did you, anybody go out last night? Oh, yeah. Yes. Anybody hear some amazing music last night? Anybody had some great food last night? Yeah. Yes. Have you enjoyed this session, though, QRIS session? Put your hands together for Bill if you have. So truly welcome, and thank you for taking the time to come at the end of this QRIS session, where we have focused on expanding reach, enhancing impact, and advancing equity. Mm -hmm. And one of the beautiful things about QRIS is that it's beginning to give us a common language, a common vocabulary, to talk about how we increase reach, impact, and equity. It's also giving us the opportunity to really focus on the things that have long-term impact on the lives of children. And with us this morning is an amazing group of women who have dedicated a significant amount of their personal and professional life to making certain that we enhance the quality of life for families and children in our country. This is going to be an interactive experience. So we need you to participate. I know you might be a little tired, but we want you to get involved and get your questions ready. I hope all of you participated in the poll. How many people participated in the poll? All right, so we're gonna use that poll. We're gonna need some of you to participate. We're gonna use that poll to be able to support our conversation here today. And so with that, I'd like to introduce myself. My name is Marie St. Fleur, and I am proud to be part of the BUILD team. I want to thank BUILD for inviting me to be here. I, um, I'm a consultant with BUILD. I've had the pleasure of being able to be a state rep in Massachusetts for over 11 years. All right. But I'm a recovering mm -hmm. lawyer. So um, <laughs> it's good to she be in spaces right. with all of you. And so with that, I'd love to introduce first um, our first panelist who you'll hear from. I'm going to give some brief information about them, but then in their conversation with you, because it is a conversation, they're going to tell more about their life experience and how it connects to the work that all of you are doing every day. And so our first um, panelist that I'd like to introduce is Shannon Christian. Shannon heads up the Federal Office of Child Care at the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services and she oversees funding of state, territory, and tribal child care subsidy programs and related quality investments. We're delighted that she's here with us this morning. We look forward to her words of encouragement and um, information to all of you. And I'd also like uh, to introduce next to her is Dr. Ola J. Friday. Dr. Friday is, the, is, at the, is working at the Massachusetts Department of Early Education and Care. She is the Associate Commissioner for Workforce Development. Mm -hmm. And you know, she had a quote in her bio that I have to actually share, because I love this quote, where she said, um, from Frederick Douglass, where she said, it's easier to build strong children than to repair broken men. Mm -hmm. And what you do is helping build really okay. strong children. So yeah. thank you, that's a, such an apt quote. So thank you all for giving us that this morning. I also want to then introduce you to Christina. Christina Passion Zayas, right? Yes. Um, Christina directs the policy and leadership initiatives at Erickson Institute. She's established the Early Childhood and Leadership Academy and the Community Lab for Illinois. And she's going to tell you about the amazing work. I hear she's a firecracker. So I can't <laughs> wait to hear some of the things that she's going to share with all of us this morning. I am pleased, um, I've had the chance to get to know this woman over the past five or six years. 
Her name is Debbie Mathias. Debbie Mathias is the most, is proud of her 27 years of local work in rural communities and starting and developing a network of high quality care and early education um, programs um, following an intense period working on quality issues at the state level. So she has a lot of amazing work to share with us um, and she's a dedicated um, family person and she has a number of dogs which she might be able to work <laughs> into some of her conversations with you this morning. <laughs> So we're happy that Deb is, is um, here to, 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 to talk with us. Um, as I've messed up the order here, Bibi or Terrell? Now many of you know Bibi, and we can't wait to hear more from her. She began her career as a teacher, has spent 25 years developing and managing early childhood programs as a community development strategy. Um, she currently advises in philanthropy among the many things that she does. And so she is going to be an amazing person to hear and share with as well. And with us as well is Cynthia Tate. All right, <laughs> Cynthia Tate. Now I can go on with all her titles. She's Executive Director, Illinois Governor's Office of Early Childhood Development. Um, she leads um, strategic partnerships with state agency leader leadership and private sector partners to develop and implement early childhood policies across multiple state agencies. Now you notice that I ran through all of this because they're going to take time to really share with you their experiences and connect that to the work that you're doing. Are you ready? Yep. You're ready? Yeah. Then I want you all to give yourselves a hand for all the work that you continue to do for children across this country. And I don't think sometimes you recognize it, so we're going to continue to celebrate you. So our first order of business is a quick lightning round. All right, from, and we're gonna ask our panelists if they would share with us what they've learned at the conference and, um, and share their perspective and insight on something that they learned on this conference and perhaps give us a little bit more on their bio. And so with that, I'll turn it over to Shannon. Okay, so I think that probably what's made the biggest impression on me is understanding how incredibly complicated it is for, um, early childhood education professors to get their ed higher ed systems to work with them to meet the needs of the burgeoning early childhood workforce across from the very beginning up to the higher levels, but particularly at the entry levels, and that I want to really try to do something with that, and the connections I made here are going to help me with that. Thank you. So, Phoebe, can you share a little bit about what you've learned and some insights today? So, um, I think we've, we've come a long way in this whole conversation about equity. Mm -hmm. And so, it, it, it has woven through a lot of what we did over the last couple of days. Uh, we've become more conscious about it. Uh, we've learned to define it. Um, but as I listen to the, to the workshops and a lot of the side conversations, um, I still, I'm, I'm still struck that we're really struggling with the application of what does equity really mean in terms of our day-to-day -day, of our day-to-day -day work, and um, we're still, you know, as we as we look at our work, I think we're still really responsible for figuring out. Um, what is inherently biased about policies and practice that we are responsible for carrying out. We may not be responsible for having developed the, the policy uh, or even the particular program. Um, so what is it that we need to, and what I'd like to really hear from all of you is, what do you need in terms of tools, in terms of information, to be able to, wherever you are in your leadership role, is to be able to go deeper into a policy and a program and really understand sort of inherent bias, inherent racism, um, and really get to structural issues uh, in terms of, of equity. So that, that would be my, my challenge for this group today. And so my last first, this first round, I'm gonna go to Deb. All right. Debbie, share with us what your insights have been and what you're learning and hoping All to right. connect with. Building on what Shannon said, it's complicated, <laughs> right? Are you feeling it? <laughs> but I think that by beginning um, with authentic beneficiary voice of families and providers using data and a continuous quality improvement mindset in our learning community together, we can make progress toward equitable early childhood systems 
that reduce disparities and improve the lives of those we aim to serve. CQI rocks. <laughs> <laughs> so I know that, so you've heard the three who've um, given a quick um, thoughts around what they're thinking about. You have any questions? Any of you, let's get involved. It's a conversation. What, 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 have, what insights have you gathered from this meeting the past three days? What excited you? What moved you? What do you want to share? Come on, somebody, let's go. I know it's early. Who's going to join us in this? There, where's the mic's in the, the main aisles right there. I see, I can't even see that. But there's a mic right there. So come on up. There's a mic right here. That I have to shorten. <laughs> <laughs> I have to, too. All right, so please. I'm going to let her go first. Go, go right ahead. Yeah, okay. So what I've heard is that, and what I believe in, is that we have to look at equitable policies and practices. I think there's a huge disconnect between what we hear and that what our states are doing around QRIS. So you ask what we need. We need those that are making these policies to listen to those who implement them and make changes. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. BB, I don't know if you want to check on that, if you want to comment on that, since that well, was one of your mo moments. I really think that uh, we've got an opportunity. Organizations like Build and some of our uh, national funders and other to really to provide some tools to do that. Because one is one thing is to listen to our criticism or to our feedback. The other is to actually have the tool that helps you analyze a piece of policy and and take it and begin with the why and then go deeper and deeper until you really get to the root of why that policy, I mean, we can go through this, for example, in housing policies, and right. yesterday we heard a little bit about redlining. Well, what happened with redlining and why, and then what are the federal policies that were underlined around that that, that got communities um, so segregated, even communities who didn't want to be segregated. In education, early childhood, I think we have exactly the same kinds of issues. So I'm going to move to the mic right there. Come on, talk so about I'm, the mic. I'm, this is a conversation. So I'm going to um, say that I'm, I'm kind of sort of surprised that after session after session after session, agencies are still not using the expertise of their families because their families know exactly what they need in their communities. And it just, it's, it's just really surprising to me. Every time I raise my hand, are you asking your families what you need? And the answer is no, not yet. And I don't understand why. I'd like to respond to that yeah, yeah, thank you. because yeah. I think that you're on to something. We can craft stronger systems um, by engaging and hearing authentically what families, what providers, what even the intermediary support folks. We've got to do a better job of engagement and, and responding to the needs of families on the ground and, and the providers. And I think that you're really on to something with that comment. Thank you for saying that. Yeah, and, and I just want to add, because every, every piece of um, paperwork that I've read over, the data shows, if you incorporate your families, you will get better outcomes. You cannot do work for families if you do not engage with your families and ask them what it is that they need. Perfect. Thank you. This has been a really remarkable couple of days, but um, my heart is breaking over the stories of the children in, um, I, I don't even want to call them detention centers because they, that would dignify the conditions that they're living under and the families, and especially the, the father who died carrying his toddler on his back, trying to swim to freedom um, and safety. So I want to know how we address the needs of those children as well as the children where, who we, ju we dignify as citizens. So there's an issue in equity, right? Because we think about equity, you know, it impacts family across all categories, right? And so, um, you know, and, and that's, uh, you know, I, I don't know any of us have any words for what we've been watching, right? But I, I want to turn to Bibi for a little, a little while, maybe to comment on that and perhaps give us some cues on how to support families. Because many of you have families who are immigrants that you're working with, whether in your family-based centers or in your group centers, and this is frightening to many of them. And so perhaps um, 
you can give us some, some insight, and then I'd like to go into the second round to get some of the folks there to introduce themselves a little bit more to the audience, and maybe touch on some of what you've heard thus far. Oscar Martinez, yes. and his 23-year-old, 23-month-old Angie Valeria. So let's name them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Let's, let's make sure that we understand they have a name. They are somebody's family. They are somebody's parent, child, son, daughter. And the names that this administration in this, in this moment has chosen to give our people. Um, I am an immigrant myself, daughter of immigrants. Uh, my children are sons and daughters of immigrants. Uh, and I, I take this very, very, very personally. Um, these many images, and I would call them cages. So we have not only the image of this father and this daughter, but we have the multiple images of our children in cages. Um, we're going to look 50 years from now and ask, how did we let that happen? What was going on in this country that we sat around and talked about children and equity and all of this, and we allowed our children to be in cages? So I think the question is, what can you do? Because we feel very helpless. We're not in charge of the policies in terms of immigration. So the, I would say, if you're on the ground level in a program, um, and you, you're serving families and you're working in a community, make sure families know the rights. Uh, the National Immigration Law Center has a great website. You can pull down the information. You don't have to make it up. You don't have to be an expert in immigration. But make sure that you hand to every parent in the language they can understand and that you connect them to know their rights when somebody knocks on the door, when somebody comes to their employment, when their families are separated, for those, for those families who are here already. Be vocal locally, because there are lots and lots of local jurisdictions that are passing legislation, that are passing policies and laws around the Trust Act, around um, participation with uh, um, enforcement rates and so on. So you have the opportunity to be able to locally make sure that your community uh, is able to support families. When you know that it is, there is someone in the private sector in your community who is getting a grant from the federal government to rent an old school building to house 250 uh, 50 children, don't let it happen. This is the only way, as long as the private sector allows themselves to be in the business of housing children in these cage-like situations, then there is an opening. So please do that. And finally, everybody's got congressmen and senators, except for those of us in the District of Columbia. So I'm begging that you speak for all of us, too. Um, is get your congressmen and your senators to, to, do, to do the right thing um, in terms of not only the, the, the humanitarian support, but in terms of the changes they need to have in, a, um, uh, in immigration policy. This is a name, Oscar Martinez, Angie Valeria. And let's please name all of the families that we're, that we're talking about. Thank you. So thank you for the questions. Thank you. We're going to continue to, to, to share. And we look for, look for your expertise as well. I'm going to turn it to Ola, and, and hopefully she's sharing an insight about what's connected for her in this um, conference, and a little bit more about yourself. So, uh, thanks, Maurice. Um, so I think, again, this idea of equity really resonated for me um, in a way that it hasn't before at this conference. Uh, and thinking that, you know, we have, I think, done a lot of work um, in thinking about how we differentiate our QRS standards by program uh, type or setting. And so we have family child care uh, standards and you know, center base, and we talk about public school versions because we want to really respect and honor the differences across those, uh, those settings. But I think we have another layer of work to do when we think about equity and how our mandates and uh, expectations around QRIS not only need to be differentiated by setting type, but also by are the many, many other factors that impact programs' ability to meet these, uh, these expectations and meet these mandates. And so how are we really doing the work of understanding the communities that programs are in, the challenges that the families that uh, programs are serving um, are facing, the challenges that the educators in the programs themselves are facing. So I think that's some hard, deep work that's sort of the, the next level of equity work that we need to do in QRIS. So that really resonated for me um, this time around in the conference. 
Thank you. And we're going to continue with Christina. What's yeah. impacted you? Um, this conference for me, I, I think this is my third or fourth year, and I've been doing professional association conferences for 18 years. This is the best. And the reason why, let's, let's give it up to BUILD, because this, this is a huge undertaking. The reason why I say that is because it's a beautiful intersection of theory, practice, as well as provocative thought and action. We don't just sit here and discuss the issues. We let them ruminate in our heads. We take them back to our communities. We push each other. And so yet earlier this morning, we were talking about, for us, it's a process of unlearning. When we talk about racial equity, all of us have been infected by interlocking systems of oppression that essentially render some populations more valuable than others. And we have to engage in that very difficult work where we problematize our own biases and continue to learn, continue to interrogate how are we contributing to systems of inequity and how are we reimagining and transforming those systems. The outcomes that we see right now in our systems that we're not okay with, we're actually doing what they were intended to do. So this is really work that is inherent and it connects with the statement of human rights work. Early childhood is all about human rights and, if it's, and, and social justice. It starts at that point. In Illinois, in our meeting yesterday, we were talking about the revolution, and the revolution starting with infants and toddlers. And so that's really what this work is about, and that's why I love coming to this conference, because I'm like, I'm amongst a whole bunch of people where we can shake it up. So. <laughs> I was feeling revolutionary yesterday. <laughs> so my, um, my learning from the conference was really more of um, a deepening of an understanding of an orientation that I've been struggling with for a bit, um, which is the way in which our resource distribution is deeply inequitable and the mechanisms for resource distribution are established on a set of values that are in direct conflict with the work of early childhood. Direct conflict. So where we value speaking for those who have no voice, our distribution systems say, be quiet, don't talk. We, we value collaboration and partnership, and our resource distribution systems say, nope, it's competitive. Right? This is why we're struggling with the PDG, frankly, right now, because the values that underlie the systems of distribution of the resources are not consistent with ours. We are, as you said, about social justice, and that is not the basis on which the resource distribution systems are built. So that's my big takeaway, and I'm fired up. <laughs> We've talked about equity, we've talked about it in the context of immigration, we've talked about it in the context of distribution of resources, but tell, tell us your experience. Yeah, the mics are here, the mics are there, so please, share with us, and your experts too, and so let's share with each other. Please, go ahead. Hi there, Janet from Vermont again. I know I stand up every uh, session, but um, one of the things that I've been um, thinking about is the resource distribution. and. Um, you know, we have some of our uh, funding streams that are designed, you know, to, to be means tested. A huge portion of how, right, early education resources come to families are, is means tested. And then that which, you know, gets the resources to that potentially to the highest need people and communities, but then it also creates income segregated programs um, a lot of times. Mm -hmm. Or, and then that comes in direct conflict with, you know, with our public education values. And so then as we try to layer on to pre to pre-K and establish universal pre-kindergarten programs and states don't have enough money to do that. So do you give a small benefit to all the people or do you give, um, you know, do you direct that to um, the kids that we know uh, need those supports the most? And just, it's a huge um, thing that I've just been grappling with since the, you know, mm -hmm. throughout this, this session of, you know, from a policy perspective, uh, to what extent is the, our mean, is means testing, you know, getting us to, um, reinforcing reinforcing segregation mm -hmm. 
but we don't have enough money, so how do we, how do we make that work? Mm -hmm. Yeah, but I'm glad you raised it up because all of us need to then go look at our policies, our regulations, and our practices to see how we attack that. Shannon, what do you think? Well, we've actually been looking through an equity lens for probably 20 years in this program, and that the things that are coming up here are things that we've been wrestling with for a long time. And with PDG, we, the first round of the PDG Birth to Five grants, we ended up giving them to everybody who had a passing score because we wanted everyone, every state that submitted a decent application to be able to go through the strategic planning and thorough needs assessment phase and take a year to think about how to rebuild a system that makes sense for them. And so um, I don't know that, that we always fall into that competition piece. Um, the money that we have is directed towards low-income families, and the most recent um, legislation that passed for us talks about um, states needing to prioritize their investments to the lowest income children and the highest concentration areas of poverty first. So I don't know that we all fall into this generalization. I think it's important that we're all thinking about it, but I think there's enough flexibility in a lot of what we do to make the policy changes you want to make. I don't think that, that you're constricted. And you know we're a huge funder, so that's an important piece behind. And with the next round of PDG, if we can't get to everybody, at least people have put together the thorough needs assessment and strategic plan that they can shop around to um, different uh, state level philanthropic organizations or even national level and, and try to do the work that, that they laid out there. And uh, you know we're on board, more money, better policies, yeah. less discrimination, equity lens, but we're doing a lot of other things too, like with the home-based childcare um, early learning framework that we've put together, we're trying to make sure that home-based childcare has the same shot at um, higher stars in a QRIS system and the same shot at higher reimbursement levels as, as centers. Mm -hmm. And that's to help with the equity piece that's there. Right. And then we have um, with uh, our own CCDF, CCDBG law, we are now sent um, corrective action plans to the states who had not, who had fallen the furthest behind with paying base rates to um, child care providers that allow parents a decent choice among what's out there in the market. So I feel like we're working on this. Yeah. Our Office of Policy, um, OPRE Planning, Research and Evaluation has a work group that's been going for years that looks at, at, um, at race, ethnicity, and equity. So obviously, every we all have a long ways to go, but this isn't new information to us, so I don't want people to not feel supported by the federal government in these areas? Yeah, no, I think that we do. And I think that we, I think that for us, our experience was that the values were so clearly articulated, you know, that this is about collaboration, this is about coordination, this is about partnership, that it then put us in the position of being able to, because now I'm seeing it as, it was a real frustration. Now it's an opportunity mm -hmm. to okay. take this and to say, look, this is the federal direction that says these are the values we stand for. And now state, That's right. you know, your systems are working in contradiction to this. So if we're going to do what we need to do to exemplify those values and execute the system building that we need to execute, then you're going to have to change your distribution system. So it's, so yes, I think we're some I values are clear. Yeah. So I want to go to the mic. I want to go to Mike and come on, give us some feedback here, right? Um, we're not trying to solve it, but we want to hear because it gives us a way to think about this. It gives you a way to go back and think about this, these issues. Are you with me? Yeah. Is this informative? Yeah. All right. So let's 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 get engaged. I want to turn it over to the mic. Come to the mic. I, I don't see you at the mic. Come to the mic. So, so I wanted to go back to the comment about children in cages. Yes. And um, this isn't new. Um, the United States incarcerates more children than uh, any other country. And so I wanted us to think about um, the role of early childhood in um, perpetuating that in terms of excluding children from preschool who might have special needs um, and not allowing some families with, uh, with children with, uh, who are high needs into their programs in a variety of ways. Maybe we don't have the supports for you, et cetera. And I wondered if the panel would comment on how that should be addressed within a QRIS system. Thank you. 
Deb or BB, anyone out here want I, to take it on? I really think that's an important um, point. And there has been a lot of work going on across the country with states taking a deeper dive around expulsion policies okay. and the supports that are necessary for children to live in uh, you know, regular settings with their peers. And so I appreciate that you brought it up in that context, too, because I think it is a, um, something that we need to carefully continue to work on, deepen our expertise and the supports for the providers to be able to do a good job in this area. Um, and families are really helping to drive this conversation uh, for us too. And I think that's an important, back to your point, an important component here. Together, we should be able to solve this and, and do a better job on it. And I turn to my colleagues, anything else anyone wants to add in on that? I would just add that it, it is definitely, I think, um, a big issue that we are looking at in Massachusetts, but I think across the country. Um, this idea of how do we better support educators in supporting families and children with needs and you know challenging behaviors or whatever you want to call it. But I think there's a there's a huge support need for the field for the profession mm -hmm. that we have not um, always addressed and attended to. That we are now really realizing this is really big. And so how do we think about training or professional development mm -hmm. that really speaks to that? And really, also the addition of a cross-sector approach, I think, is important here. You know, let's also turn to our health systems, our family engagement systems, and get a better cross-sector approach to helping families I and children. With that, kids don't yeah. live in um, yeah, vacuum, right? They right. they live in, 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 in communities and they live families. experiencing various um, challenges, and we need to bring everybody together to make it work. I'm going to go to this mic and then go to the mic right there. So please. great. Thanks, thanks for the conversation. So I just want to pivot back to uh, what Shannon was mentioning around the flexibilities around rules and regulations. And as someone who's had both the perspective at the federal level and now being down at the local level and really being with families, one of the things I would just, it's a comment and encourage folks to do here that whoever you're getting funding from, whether you're a grantee, whether you're a leader in an organization, whether you're at the state level, it's really critical for all of us to understand our rights as we're accepting mm -hmm. that money, but also understand the flexibilities that you have to push back so that you can make the best decisions about how you're using that money to support your community. So thanks for bringing that up. So you know what, Where are you, wh which state are you from? I should ask California. I California. Much people to share that because you know we're, we're getting the same vocabulary and language, yeah. but we're all beginning to implement and we're in different stages of that implementation. So it's great to yeah. share. So please, which California. state? California. That. Thank you. Yep. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, I'm from Pennsylvania, and I brought this up in our meeting yesterday. We have for years said we will leave no child behind. And that has been a mandate, and that has been a cry that we have said. We also recognize the federal government has allowed that the child care choices that the children are in are their parents' choice. But there's one group of children we are forgetting about. And for Pennsylvania, we've done away with the friend and neighbor care, but we have relative care. And so those children, what about those children that are there with their grandmothers, their aunties, or whomever? What are we gonna do about them? Because we're leaving them behind in that we're paying the relatives to care for them, but we're not giving them any other resources that will allow them to be ready for school. And that's unfair to the child because the child will arrive in our preschool programs. The teachers will be frustrated. The children will be frustrated. We have them acting up because they are behind. So are we really following our statement that we are leaving no child behind? That's my question. Christine? You know, it, it kind of, I think all of this is undergirded by, to Bibi's point, root cause. Like, in some situations, like what you're describing, families are accessing this resource actually as a source of revenue. And that source of revenue is needed because there are not other resources available to have 
revenue coming into the home, have a living wage, all of those pieces. And it's like, that's again, goes back to my whole point about even though we're in early childhood, we can't stay in our lane, so to speak. We really do need to be out there advocating around housing policy, economic development, recognizing the assets in our community and how do we invest and how family child care home-based, whether it's licensed or not, plays a critical role because the majority of our children are actually, in Illinois at least I can speak to, are actually in home-based child care with licensed, licensed exempt. Point is, majority are there, but we need to think about how do we leverage that because they serve such important roles in our communities. They're, they're small businesses in some cases. They are community watch. They are community strength resilience factors for communities. So how do we support that? But if we don't, if absent of the analysis of the root cause and our role to be able to kind of push other domains, so to speak, whether it be housing or economic development, we have to be present in those conversations as well. So, so yes, yes. But just, just adding and totally, totally in agreement and adding to that is the fact that our families and many of our lower income families, our immigrant families, are also in those jobs that don't fit the structures that we've built in, in early care and education. Um, they're working that four to ten shift. Right. Um, how, do you, how do you manage that? And so the the family friend neighbor uh, becomes your your alternative. Aside from the family income and 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 so on, it really is about trying to make sure that uh, as you as you ask the question about parents, um, how many more types of childcare would we develop um, and and facilitate if in fact we really paid attention to what the work hours and the workforce needs. Um, obviously what the children need, but also what their families need. Yes, Jane. Um, we have data showing that about um, at least half of low-income families work at least some non-traditional hours, and yet the only 8% of child care centers provide care in non-traditional hours. So that means the family, friend and neighbor, family, child care, all of that is extra important, and yet we have lost between 40 and 45% of that provider network, both um, the licensed care for everybody and the ones that the CCDF children use that might also be license exempt. That's a huge loss and a huge mismatch between what's out there. And part of that, I think there's a little bit of a tendency to discount the value of home-based child care that I think yeah. we have to get past. And, and in Pennsylvania, you shouldn't have eliminated categories of care. The law says you need to provide the families that are subsidized with the same set of choices that an unsubsidized family would have. And yes, there isn't enough money to go around, but at least if they're in the system, you can, and even if it's family, friend, and neighbor care, you can be sharing, at least they're listed, you know about them, you can be sharing your training resources with them. There are also all of these un, unpaid um, resources out there that, that have money to work with those families. Like, PBS and a lot of those organizations that, that try to reach family, friend, and neighbor with um, extra learning opportunities for children, that if you're active at the community level, you can draw on those resources. So I think we need to be paying attention to that group, but there is a huge underground workforce of people taking care of these children for pay that, um, that we don't have a, a legitimate way to outreach to because they're not in the system. And we have to figure out what's, what's keeping them out of the system and how do we draw them back in and how do we make sure we're raising the quality of care and investing across the entire network and not just looking at the ones we think are doing everything right and making them even a little better. You know, it's really important, I think, to be looking across the entire spectrum. And when we come out um, starting at the end of this year and beginning of next year with the new, the new national stu study on um, it's nationally representative study on early care and education. We will see how much change there's been from 2012 to now in um, the, pro the providers, who's serving, you know, what kind of trained provider is serving what income level of children. And right now, our most vulnerable children are with our least trained and educated providers. And this can't continue. So I encourage you to stay on top of the data. Yeah. So and she wants to make a point, and then she's been waiting in line. So five I, point on that. Yeah, go ahead. I just wanted to add something. 
We know where these children are. That's right. We're paying for them to be there. That's right. So since we're paying, when I'm paid for something on my job, there's a requirement I have to meet so I keep getting my salary. If we're paying the friend, family, neighbor, caregiver, why not say every other month, I need you to come into your subsidy office, and while you're there for an hour and a half, give you something that you can take back, whether it's a book, whether it's some type of development toy, something to take back, and some information to say, this is how to help your grandson, your granddaughter, your niece, your nephew, get ready to be in school. So that's a state level decision. You can make that happen. Yes, you can. Mm -hmm. I'm going to turn over to this mic right here. We've got a few people line up. Yay! Yeah. Yeah. I love seeing you standing up there. So I wanted Which to stage? say that I appreciate the focus on family child care. I'm um, representing the board of NAFCC here um, this week, along with my other paid work. Um, but we appreciate the focus on family child care, and I appreciate the focus on tribal relations. Um, I'd like to see more encouragement or requirements for states to reach out to the family child care community to invite them to the table rather than um, hearing the same rhetoric. I mean, it's great that the pathway is there, but we constantly hear, get yourself to the meetings. And um, we can find out who is having the meetings, but we're having to invite ourselves to the party. And that's a little awkward for family child care providers. Um, so maybe some help with encouraging states more strongly to be sure that they have the right people at the table rather than asking the people who should be there to get themselves there. And there's also a reticence for some states if it's not so-called licensed to even touch the issue, right? So we pretend they're not there sometimes. Yeah, Vivi? So clearly the yeah. same solutions that would apply to a um, ch center-based child care as well may not apply to those who are providing right. home-based care and are certainly um, un, um, unregulated or, or family uh, a friend. So, so why not use different strategies? Um, versus uh, come to a centralized sex meeting or, or that sort of thing. Let's borrow and look at what other professions have done. Promotores, for example, in the health field mm -hmm. have been a really significant way of reaching families and reaching uh, communities um, around healthcare. So what if we had promotoras, promotores, either one, um, I won't get sexist, um, to go out and if we are paying for them, if we know where they are, is to actually do home visits with those families and provide the services where they are as opposed to asking people to always come to us. And just to follow up on that to say that I'd like to thank you for recognizing and focusing on tribal inclusion and hope to hear in the future ways to reach out to and include tribal citizens that don't live on reservations or are in outside tribal communities. Support for those children and families is important and government to government contact may not be the way to reach them and, and fully include them, but I think that's a future conversation. Thank you for standing up and making that point. That's actually a really great point of a community that always absent. Do we have any thoughts on that, tribal communities? Right. How do we, think how we right. make them more visible? Because there are yes. some groups yeah. that are rendered invisible in this process. Yeah. Any thoughts? I would, I'd like to add, because it, it was interesting, last night was the first um, presidential Democratic yes. primary debate, um, and I, I think it's really important that we examine all candidates on both sides, um, and, and we really look specifically for platforms around these issues. I was surprised that one, out of the, the, the host of the Democratic candidates, I only saw one that had a very specific platform on Native Americans. I've never seen that before. And so I think we need to be vigilant about this in this process because we have a big voice and because we intersect with so many different disciplines, we can really push this to the forefront in terms of having deeper discussions right. and greater commitments to serving communities such as the one you All mentioned. Communities. Thank you. Oh. Thank you. We're going to go to this mic and then over here. Thank I'm you. just going to um, piggy piggyback on the young lady who was sitting right here in the green. I think she's over there from, um, yeah. from Pennsylvania. Um, things don't have to be so complicated. When you are given a family home care taker, home care provider, a check, on the back of that check, it could be a description. We can now start turning this into jobs with a description on what it is that she needs to do to service that child from zero to eight years old. It's not that complicated. We are given a check and, I, and, and, and not asking for anything in return, but at the same time, when the child comes to the school, just like she says, they're unprepared. How you can prepare that child is if you give instructions. That's simple. That is very simple. Give instructions. Everybody wants to help. We cannot keep saying that we care about these kids if we're not reaching the homes and doing something about it. Thank you. Thank you. Great, great idea. So we have some amazing ideas.
is coming out of this. Please tell all your state. Yeah. Hi, I'm State Representative Brenda Carter. State. Hey. <laughs> and I decided to stay here because I was totally impressed with the hunt. Institute, the QRS system, the whole entire thing the state legislators are not privy to. Thank I you. think we have an opportunity here to connect legislators and people working in the field. I think it's a novel opportunity. That's why I stayed. I'm glad I did. But here's my question. <laughs> but here's my question because I deal with a population that I didn't hear about in this in the conference, and this to the entire panel and anybody else that want to talk to me. What are we doing to reach across to our homeless? Do you know in Michigan, Michigan, my state, <laughs> we have a surge in homeless children. So what kind of uh, priorities are we taking, developmental processes, et cetera, to address those children that do not have a home? Thank you. Anybody that cares to answer? Thank you. Shannon, want to take a look at that? Ola? Shannon, yeah, the latest um, revision of the rules that govern the Child Care and Development Fund include um, a requirement to reach out to the homeless and serve the homeless as a priority population. So um, I think that the numbers are just way bigger than anybody expected, in part because of the opioid crisis. Mm -hmm. And I think it's sort of daunting. And people have to learn new skills to be able to reach out. But um, ACF has held homeless um, forums across the country over the last six months, and the issue of childcare keeps coming up. So you're right to acknowledge it, and I think we haven't figured it out yet, and um, we need to. So thank you for bringing it up. Thank you. Ola, any yeah. thoughts? Uh, I'll just quickly add that, uh, at least in Massachusetts, but I'm sure in other states, you know, Head Start, Head Start is playing a really pivotal role, I think, in this issue, and really looking to address the needs of homeless families, um, and also families dealing with the opioid crisis. So, our Head Start Collaboration Office and that director and, and those programs are really essential to some of the strategies that we're doing to address that, that issue. Any other thoughts that we could hand out there? Because it's a huge, is it a problem across the country? Those of you, the homeless yeah, yeah. issue, are you seeing it yeah. and you say, can I show your hands? Are we seeing it? And do you think you're getting the tools to really talk about it or support the families? Uh, can I get an answer? Can, can so, I, can I ask, some ideas. Can I ask another you. question? Yeah. How many of you work with your housing, or, uh, with, with housing policy and with your economic development policy makers uh, uh, or, or directors? Because again, we, you know, I know I sound like a broken record. We gotta go back to root causes. Yeah. Uh, you know, we're spinning our wheels about how to get the homeless kids, but let's spin our wheels about how, why is it that children are homeless? Yeah. Um, and what policies are happening? And I, I, um, I choose to disagree, Shannon. I don't think we don't have the money. I think we don't make the right choices as where to invest. Um, and that our communities, our communities can choose to invest on a stadium um, and, and not be invest on you know, hundreds of families who must be homeless. Um, I think there is a real value issue here, but I, I do think that as folks involved in this work with children and families, we have to stick our noses in everywhere. Um, and we have to be really, really vigilant about housing policies and economic development policies and small business policies and make sure that they're listening to us, they, get, they have our language. And not only those who are making policy, but, our, but the advocates who are advocating to the same folks we are, the coalition of advocacy um, around um, housing policies and early childhood policies is a very natural coalition. Absolutely. Um, and so knowing our numbers of how many children are homeless and then understanding what those housing policies are around affordable housing, um, I think are really, are really key pivotal points in terms of uh, the best way that we can reach out to homeless children is to give them housing. Yeah. And if I can, and just, I, wanted, oh, I yeah. just wanted to jump in and say that in Illinois, we've been, you know, working on this issue, and we have folks that are very active with it. But we are sort of in a recovery mode um, from state policy that was very um, uh, uh, interpretive of uh, how we use child care for the homeless population. Uh, if they're not working, then why do they need child care? I mean, folks literally said this in meetings. And so, you know, we have to... Um, we have to, again, at the state level, push 
for the value change that we need to see because it's still all about the mindset and the values. And childcare isn't as valuable as, as uh, you know, pre-K because education is more valuable than babysitting. And this kind of mentality is, is really something that, as I say, we're actively trying to recover from. And that is why we have to, you know, that's the kind of um, change that's gonna have to occur in, for, in order for us to be effective with the homeless population. We have to change the way we see child care and the values that underlie how we design the system. I want to correct something. I, I didn't say there's not enough money somewhere. I'm saying the child care programs are not funded to absorb the homeless child care needs right now because we don't even serve without counting the homeless. We don't serve but a fraction of those who are eligible. So if we, for every homeless child we serve, that's one fewer child of a working parent we can serve. And it's putting people back in that really tough choice environment. And I think you're exactly right. We have to look at what are all the other funding sources that we might be able to direct towards this and what are the policies that are pushing this. But I also say that when we try to serve the children that come to us through the child welfare system, which is also increasing tremendously because of the opioid crisis and the homeless, it is a big burden to think that child care is going to just absorb that with current funding. I hear a huge advocacy thing. <laughs> <laughs> I hear a huge advocacy coming, coming from this, this audience. Uh, good morning, Daniqua Matthias. I'm from New Jersey. And, um, <laughs> yes. Um, so I think that uh, the panelist is absolutely spot on when she says that we have policies that uh, promote practices that are antithetical to our values as an education system. And I think that we need to recognize from a broad level, from a policy level, that this is a multifaceted, multi-channeled system where families interact either in child care centers, home providers, neighbors, family, whichever stream they feel most comfortable with. But we have allowed these policies to put us in a position of competition and not a position of coalition. Yeah. And so when we talk about um, children who are with neighbors or friends or relatives who don't have that exposure to uh, uh, direct education or instruction, best practices, how are we engaging those providers who do this on a daily basis to work with those who do not? And that's where I think we need to focus energy and attention and research. Thank you. I'm going to go to the next person at the mic and then come to this mic here, and then we'll come back to the panel. Hi, Re Rebecca from New Jersey as well. I'm curious what your thoughts are on how to balance um, intentionality along with data collection and standards and accountability. So I think that sometimes we get caught up in um, gathering the data and following the standard that the intention behind what it is that we're trying to do with quality improvement sort of falls to the wayside um, to you know these requirements and so how do you marry or make way um, for allowing for intentionality to drive some of the work that we're doing with quality improvements anybody hmm. Come on. I think it goes back to um, the, the very first comment in terms of engaging beneficiaries and, and interrogating to what extent are we doing that on a regular basis. I mean, just think yourself in your own role. How often do you actually sit down and have a conversation or engage with a beneficiary beyond, hey, fill out this paperwork or turn this in? To really understand, I mean, do we really invite people to the table? Do you hold yourself accountable for having those types of interactions and bringing folks around the table to really learn what are the barriers? Because I think sometimes we get caught up in being beholden to policy and not people, even though policy is supposed to be about people. And how do we continue to have that reminder is really engaging those that are going to be most feel the greatest impact of those decisions. They have, because it's, it's usually the folks that are furthest away from those, having to live with those decisions, making those decisions. So how do we flip that paradigm to have people who have to live with those decisions? Do you really have skin in the game? Some of this refl reflects the conversation yesterday. Mm -hmm. If we're gonna talk about these systems, these programs, these structures, did you put your child in a home-based program? Did you experience that? Did you figure out how you might need to support your home-based provider and connect them? I mean, it's, it's, it becomes, how does this become ingrained in the culture of our work? 
Beneficiary voice. I mean, we've heard that from Bill, right? That's absolutely important. Does anyone else want to comment on that? Yeah. Please, Ola? Well, yeah. Just briefly, I think I want to add, I think to this point, too, about uh, we have to be constantly, I think, interrogating our systems, our standards, our policies, everything. Right. Because the, the intentionality might be, we want QRIS to be evidence-based. We want it to be research-based. What are the measurement tools that we want to incorporate into our systems? And you know, what are the indicators? And, and are, are they psychometrically you know, measured? And, and so we can get really caught up, I think, in mm -hmm. well-intentioned um, ways of designing these systems. Uh, but we have to think about, are we, are we being too, is it too much? Is it, are we losing sight actually of the heartbeat of what's happening in programs and what we want educators to be engaged in? And let's really be clear about that and not, not, not get too, even too scientific or too, too removed, I think, from really what's, what's that value, what's the core of what we're trying to do, which is quality improvement, improving the lives of children and families, supporting our educators. And that actually means doing really hard work that might not be able to be captured in a uh, indicator of standard by a, measured by a tool. So, mm -hmm. yeah. 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 I think it was Einstein that said something that about not everything that gets counted should be counted or can be counted. Yeah. Maybe I'm saying it wrong, but yeah. And yeah. so yeah. I think we've come to a place in our society right now where we think that if it's not counted, then it can't be valued, right? Yeah. Right. And so we need to balance. We need to continue because it's really about continuous quality improvement, right? It's continuous quality improvement, and the work is iterative. Um, right. And, and right. one of the things I think people think policy gets passed, and then it's passed and we're done. Right. When policy gets passed, that's when the work begins, the right? right. <laughs> and, and we have to be continuously <laughs> vigilant. And, 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 and you are the practice, you, you are the practitioners. And sometimes we need to reflect back with you in terms of whether or not it's having the right impact, right? Um, with all the research that we do, one of the things that comes up all the time is how much we still don't know about what impacts child outcomes and how much our measures don't quite meet what we'd like them to meet in terms of um, reliability. And so I think it's really important that we don't uh, put high stakes uh, bars in there that aren't proven because it does exclude people when you do that. And to realize that the, the tools and the measures and all of that continues to evolve, I think is a really important part of each one of these conversations. I want to check in with the audience. How are we doing? Is it informative? I don't hear you. somebody to come over and tell us what you're thinking and share with us, please. It's important that every segment participates. Do you agree? Yes. yes. Do you agree? Yes. yes. Do you agree? Yes. yes. Thank you. We're going to go to the mic over there. Yeah. Over here? Great. Yes, right there. Okay. Right, right. I'm sorry. Hi, Elizabeth oh, Graginski oh, from soon to be the 51st state of the nation, the District of Columbia. <laughs> but, uh, I am here to just, I mean, similar to make a comment as the uh, CCDF administrator for the District of Columbia. All of you in your state have these amazing plans that have been written uh, by really, hopefully, all of you have contributed, but definitely reading section one. There's eight sections to the CCDF plan. Everybody in this room should have read section one because there are so many required partners that we have to be working with, and not just working with, but have shared goals. So if those goals don't align with an equity focus and serving the populations of children that you all believe should be served, your administrator needs to hear from you, and there are opportunities to provide public comment and to amend those plans. 2021, we have to rewrite them all again, so this is a great time to start thinking about all these things and how do we want to amend those plans. There is so much flexibility in our states. There's very little that the federal government says we have to do except we have to ensure equal access. So please read chapter four of the CCDF plan and make sure your state is also really clear on that. Chapter six is all about the workforce. Chapter seven is all about your quality improvement system. If the measures in there do not align with what you understand, let your administrator know. I'm always wishing, would people come and tell us what is it that we need to be doing? What is it that is not reflective of our community? And again, back to section one, the public-private partnership. There's a whole piece in there that you will know how your state is thinking about this work. 
Maybe they're thinking about it in a really holistic and strong way. Maybe they're not, and they need to hear from you and your families and the parents, and there's a process for that. So I just want to encourage, and I really love PDG. I think it's a great opportunity for us to think about our Early Head Start Child Care Partnerships, our CCDF, mm -hmm. and all the public-private partnerships we have. It's a ta you can paint it the way that your community and state needs to do it right now. And I think we just want to be positive about, you know, what has happened with the reauthorization of CCDF, what happened with the rewrite of the Head Start performance standards is monumental. And as the people responsible for making this happen for children and families, we have to read those, we have to read our state plans, and we have to engage and participate at the highest level possible. So thank, thank you. Thank you. That's a great Can I ask her a question before she gets yep. away? Yep. Going back to the question earlier from the audience about um, us needing to do more to thank make you. sure people are at the table, what do, what do you do in D.C. to get that input? Because we do have that a comment period, we do require that you pull your stakeholders together, but obviously it's not really working. Not so what do you do to get that input? So we do, we do a lot of sessions. We meet with the provider community, but we do have great private sector partners, and we work with all of our state agency leads. We have an interagency steering committee that leads our Early Head Start Child Care Partnership work. We have a very involved um, state advisory council. But I mean, we are geographically, obviously, a little easier to yeah. get together. Uh, but we've now introduced uh, even webinars with our Early Head Start Child Care Partnership Policy Council. Mm -hmm. We have 30 families who come every month for two hours and help us inform the decision making around our partnership. They've made changes, they approve our staff we hire, and so we have, we have seen progress. It's been slow, so I think that's where the PDG, you know, a three, five year plan, we have to put the steps in place. But we, we have good, you know, we have a very active provider community wonderful CCRNR, great other, you know, our infrastructure in the community really helps us connect with families. So we got to build those networks and actually use yeah. them, right, yeah. and, and use yeah. them. And we have to figure out how to, where that sits in each of our states. So this mic right here. Good morning. Thank you. I'm Claire from Minnesota, and I'm mad as hell at the politics in our state legislature that keep our state from coming into minimal federal compliance with CCDBG 2014. It's ridiculous. And other than that, I wanted to say something constructive. <laughs> I feel you. So back to the homeless piece. I, I want to give credit where credit's due. I'm real mad at my state legislature for the things we haven't done around rates and equal access and all the foot dragging. But on the homeless piece, Minnesota did something good that uh, maybe some other states have done, and if you haven't, maybe it's an idea. You know, we have the federal requirement that homeless families' applications for CCDF funds have to be processed within five days. Minnesota went beyond that because we as advocates said, well, great, if you process an application, you know, but the family can't meet certain requirements, then they're just going to get a no five days sooner. So Minnesota actually went beyond the federal minimum requirement to say that homeless families can get three months of an exemption from the, the work requirement, the activity requirement, the certain paperwork they've got to get together to turn into their child care provider, and they can get a minimum amount of child care assistance during that time so parents can actually look for housing and look to get into an activity and things like that. So Minnesota did one good thing. Okay, good. thanks for sharing that. Again, look, look at your state policies and practices. Please, next. Hello, Marlo Nash. I'm with St. Francis Ministries. I actually work nationally, as does our organization, but we also provide services in um, seven states that build child and family well-being primarily connected to the child welfare system. Mm -hmm. And it's families and children involved with the child welfare system that I want to bring back up. Shannon, you mentioned them a moment ago. Um, we know that it's an, it's an equity issue that young children involved with the child welfare system have particular barriers that keep them from ask, accessing early care and education opportunities. Um, we also know that 49% of the children who go into the foster care system are age five and younger. Um, so I've been advocating and encouraging states to, with the two federal opportunities that are on the ground fresh right now in states, the preschool development grant that's been mentioned several times, 
but also the landmark federal child welfare legislation, the Family First Prevention right. Services mm -hmm. Act. It offers a fantastic time, moment in time, really? to specialize mm -hmm. a, a population focus around young children who are in the child welfare system and provide um, opportunities to help keep families together. Um, it, they're particularly vulnerable for being removed from their families because they're seen as defenseless. Obviously, we don't want to leave them in um, dangerous situations. Uh, but 68% um, of children, of young children um, who become involved with the child welfare system are involved because of neglect. And so the Family First Prevention Services Act offers opportunities to give them services to stay together. So it's a, it's a tremendous population to think about it, but it takes a specialized focus. And I'm not seeing very many early childhood communities and child welfare communities coming together. And we have, it's at the moment in time. So I'd love to see future preschool development grant applications sort of lift this opportunity up. Um, your colleague, okay. Sh Shannon, Jerry Milner is He's on the stuff. So right. there's all kinds of opportunity to work together. Right. And so I'd love to hear comments about that. We're winding up, so I want to get to everybody. I want to go to Cynthia yeah, and then so, oh, yeah. I want to say that Illinois is taking advantage of both of those opportunities. And you're exactly right. They are, are two large opportunities that exist on the table right now. I spent. Um, seven or eight years uh, in child welfare before I came to early childhood. And so we did use the PDG opportunity to build in, literally to build in a staff person to work with our early childhood developmental screening program at the Department of Children and Family Services, who will specifically focus on the barriers to early childhood programming for kids in child welfare. And so we, will, we are, are taking that on directly and specifically because of the PDG opportunity. The family's first opportunity we are working with our child welfare department in looking how, again, how to make um, home visiting in particular much more um, accessible, particularly to the children in intact, mm -hmm. where a lot of our cases of child death come from children who are already known to the system. They have come through the intact family services, that, meaning they've been left in their homes after they've had an allegation of, of abuse and neglect. And so we are working very closely with our uh, uh, Department of Children and Family Services on implementing their family first through expanded home visiting. Okay. That's great. Thank you. I, yeah, I wanted to That's ask good. you, we, um, since you're working with several states, what are you seeing are the issues that keep the family first and, and, and the, the um, child care dollars, whether it's PDG or others, from working together? Is it an interpretation of, of, the, of the policies um, or sort of what, what do you see keeps them from, from doing what Illinois is doing or others are doing? I think one, some of it is just the, that sense of I'm an early childhood advocate and there are child welfare advocates and they'll handle it kind of, you know, and so I think, I think it's just a mindset in some ways. I think that mindset is driven because committees of jurisdiction and the legislature for appropriations and, and happens at Congress to, um, you know, drive the resources in those channels and so people think in those channels. So I think it's, um, I mean, I, I've been saying to states, just even bring a small group of people together who get it. I, I love that Illinois has done it, but it's amazing to me how many states don't, they might office down the hall from one another and they're not, they're not talking and working together. But um, uh, so I think it's just some of those basic things that people aren't just thinking about the young child population comprehensively. Um, and really, and this, and and how many? I mean, I I I kind of come to calling it this. That we almost have a hidden uh, early childhood system within the child welfare system mm -hmm. because of how many young children are in the child welfare system, but mm -hmm. we're not yeah. thinking about how to bring it together. So I'm going to go you. to this mic right here, and then the the, the, the this mic. So please, please state your state. Um, I'm Jennifer Neiser. I'm from Maryland, and uh, I I just with the reauthorization of the CCDBG, I don't. I really don't think that states, legislators, the governor understands the difference from previous years to now on what the requirements are. And I feel like we, you know, we don't have enough staff to do the work that needs to be done. All of these things that we talk about are phenomenal and it's like that's what we want. We want to do these things, but it all costs money. Um, and I think the requirements that we are, that we have now, um, I, I just don't think that that truly, even state superintendent does doesn't realize the impact and, that this new this reauthorization has had. And my question is, 
how is there, is there a way that you can reach out to states and, and start really from this your level discussing the CCDBG, what is in, in what it entails, and the importance of early childhood education with that reauthorization, because I think that the reauthorization and the requirements have really put forward that the federal government is interested in this and they want the best things for young children. So how do we get the st our state leaders to really buy into that and move forward with that? So what I'm going to do, that, that's, a, that's a huge question. I'm going to take the last comment there and then when I'd ask you if you would respond to both and then perhaps yeah, give us some nice closing statements. So. Hi, I'm Gretchen Star Brunig from the state of Washington, and mine kind of piggybacks on hers. Mine's related to the workforce and compensation and what's being done to support states and tribes to pay early educators commensurate salaries and benefits to other educators. All right, Ola, you're on. <laughs> So, yep, Ola. Oh. <laughs> so we're gonna respond. We'll piggyback because I think those last two comments actually sort of piggybacked on each other. So, um, CC, how do we make certain that that plan that we understand the impact and the enormous issue around capacity for the execution and the implementation of that plan? How do we get our elected officials to understand that that the standards have changed? And then, what is the role of compensation in all of this? Is that so can we, and then perhaps share with us your closing thoughts, and then I'd love to hear from the audience their closing thoughts as we. So I will turn it all up. Ooh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> hey, give me some of the I'm not scared. It's all good. Um, <laughs> so I mean, I'll, I'll take the compensation, I think, piece to it. So, so as we know, you know, s states are doing many things. I think, I think of it as sort of uh, we're tinkering around the issue. Uh, mm -hmm. And so, you know, we tinker with it around scholarships. So, you know, we want uh, to, we want to make higher education um, access to our workforce affordable, you know, no, debt free, uh, low cost, no cost. We do that. We think about some other uh, financial strategies, maybe tax credits, tax breaks, what have you. So we, we, we tinker with, with the issue, but I think fundamentally the issue requires a significant uh, financial in public Public, public financial investment, that that is what is required to, uh, to really address that compensation mm -hmm. issue. And so I think without that, we will continue to tinker with it, uh, you know, and we will, we can support the quality enhancements, the training, the, the professional development, higher education needs. Um, we can build in wage enhancements, bonuses, whatever, but fundamentally, we cannot support the cost of wages, the appropriate wages for the workforce that is doing this work, because we do not have an appropriate funding mechanism in our system to actually support that. So with, this is a public good that is privately, predominantly privately funded, and fundamentally it's upside down, mm -hmm. and until we address that fundamental issue, we will continue to tinker with this, issue, with this you know, compensation question. Exactly. Shannon? That's right. I think that's probably true. I, you know, I would probably say not just public investment, but I think we all have skin in this game. And in addition to a bigger public investment at both the state, um, federal, and local level, we should be thinking about why don't businesses see this group as the future workforce. There are a lot of other groups that I think we need to give more to, but I think that we're up against something kind of almost hidden in our minds that I have, you know, been in this field for a long time, and I used to hear openly a lot more than I do now, but I think that this is... Parents used to raise their children at home for no cost. And how all of a sudden do we have all of these costs around raising children that used to just be taken care of at home or kind of just quietly? And I think part of it is just helping people see why, as the public as a whole, so the pressure on funding is there. How do we make people understand how important this is and why we need trained providers when people just say, well, my mother raised me and I'm fine. You know, it's, I think there's like a disconnect that we need to address. Mm -hmm. I appreciate that. So, Deb? Uh, ditto. <laughs> Thank you both. Um, but to your question, I think it speaks to about CCDBG and just the awareness. It's kind of a bottom up and potentially top down awareness building. I think the advocacy community in your state, 
can, can help to some degree with um, uh, helping the legislators be more aware, but we need to also keep our federal representatives and legislators um, aware as we get to reauthorizations and some of the big decisions. So I, I see it as an advocacy act, um, activity, you know? Um, what do you guys think? Well, I'm, <laughs> sorry, a couple of things on this, but on the, on the compensation piece, I think we need to have a marker. And we need to be able to say, this is what we want, and this is what we think is fair, and this is what we think is right for um, those of us teaching young children, whether we're teaching them in the cl classroom or in a family home or, or wherever, and that is parity with public education. Um, I think that um, if we don't have a marker, we keep tinkering. We keep figuring that we're gonna have a little bit of money here, we're gonna have, um, you know, who else would accept a stipend as opposed to actually getting more than $12 an hour or $15 an hour. Um, our, our workforce is still minimum wage workforce who they themselves are, and we've seen this in studies, who they themselves are uh, accessing public benefits because they can't afford to make a living. Um, until we can get past that, I think, and really understand that um, there has to be a level of parity um, and I'm a little surprised that I'm not getting any reaction to that because I really think that if you've got a bachelor's degree and you're being asked by your licensing requirements to have an AA or a bachelor, why shouldn't you be paid the same as the school teacher in the kindergarten or first classroom um, And, and the, the, the fear that we are, if we allow that workforce to get better credentials, then they will go to the public schools. Well, we can fix that. That's right. Um, and, and, and so I think it's, it's, that's, a really, that's a really key piece around the, around the compensation. Uh, just one more. Um, I, I think it's really important for us to make, we've talked about coalition and, and working with ac across various sort of human services and social service entities. We've not talked about what, um, how do we partner with K-12. Mm -hmm. um, and increasingly, as we look at universal pre-K, as we look at uh, the role of early care and education in child development and kindergarten readiness and third grade reading and all of those things, where are we in our partnership with K-12 and how will we um, ensure that K-12 supports us in, um, in the value judgments around, around early childhood? And that's a huge question that we're going to continue to contemplate and push forward on. I'm Send it over to Cynthia, I mean to Christina, and then I'm going to close out with Cynthia. Well, I was just going to mention that everybody should get familiar with the report that came out last year. Harriet Dichter was on the committee that came out with the Transforming the Early Care and Education Finance. And we need to get real comfortable with asking for the billions of dollars yeah. more that is required to pay for this particularly because we are lopsided. We know that 90% of the brain is developed in the first five years, yet we just put pennies towards that and think it's okay. And it's not only an issue around adequacy with pay, but it's also reinforcing systemic racism because it's women and particularly women of color doing this work mm -hmm, yeah. which is the most important foundational work for our society department of defense never apologizes for the amount of money that they get the lion's share and we need to go towards those particular departments and say we want our share because we are producing the that's people right. that are going to populate your departments that's right yeah that's right I know, I know, I know. Yeah. I agree completely with Christina. <laughs> and I'm just going to say that, that the compensation issue is inextricably tied to the quality matter. And the matter of quality is that it's not going to, um, all the processes and systems we put into place to improve quality um, are as brilliant as they are, will not work if we don't pay for the cost of quality. Mm -hmm. If we don't pay for the cost of quality, if we don't remedy the pro if we don't remedy the structural inequalities of how the resources are allocated and pay for the cost of quality in an equitable way, not an equal way, in an right. equitable way, then we're not going to get there. And so all of this wonderful work that's going on around QRIS 
you know, is, is, is struggling because it's on top of an inequitably resourced system. So I want to thank this panel. Let's try again and thank you Yeah. <laughs>
You all are amazing. Get home safely. Let's hear it for Build. Hip, hip. Hip, hip. Hip, hip. Let's hear it for Build. Hip, hip. Hip, hip. Safe travels. Thank you.